Good morning. My name is Brad. I'm the teaching elder here at The Way. If you have your copy of the Word of God, we are going to be in 2 Peter today, chapter 1, as we continue our study through the book of 2 Peter, entitled Truth War. Okay, did we come and take this and make sure I'm live? Am I live? Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Can y'all hear me? All right. There we go. There's the nursery open. Okay, and the nursery is now open, I'm told. Uh, so if you have children and you want to take them to the nursery, you may. You don't have to. You can keep them in here and uh, let them hear the word of God. They need the word of God just like everyone else. Amen. And so uh, I'm so happy that you all are here today. Uh, but again, we're going to be in Second Peter. If you don't have a copy of the word of God, we have some in the back there. If you need a copy of the word of God, we love to put the word of God into the hands of the people of God. So please uh, just raise your hand or you can go get a copy. Uh, somebody bring you one. Either way, as we talk about this idea of truth war. And that is a reminder to us that it is a war out there. And we have an enemy. And that enemy is threefold. The enemy is your own flesh. It is the devil. It is the world. And the war is primarily about truth. It's not about dominion or territory or something along that lines. It is a war for literally truth. And so today, as we get into the text of 2 Peter, we're going to talk about the fruit of discipline. The fruit of discipline. Of discipline. I want to up front talk about revival for just a minute. Revival. Uh, if you're on social media at all, you have seen uh, maybe reports of revival having broken out at the college uh, in Asbury, is that Tennessee? Kentucky. Kentucky? Asbury, Kentucky. Uh, and, and you see, this is 10, 11, 12 days apparently after a chapel service. Uh, the students just stayed and began to, to worship. And here we are 11, 12 days into this revival and it's people still coming to worship. And now people are coming from all over the place wanting to see what's happening in Asbury. And I hear reports of you know, revival breaking out in other places. And so again, uh, we ask the question, what do we do with something like this? Well, on one side of the fence, you have those who are, you know, praying for revival all the time. They're like, thank God revival has broken out. Jesus is coming again any day now. And on the other side of the fence, you have those who are like, well, this can't be revival. There's something wrong with it. They're not preaching the word of God the right way. They're, they're saying the wrong things. They're singing the wrong songs. They're doing the wrong things. I think some people are so critical sometimes. I believe that when the Lord Jesus returns, people will be there with the Bible going, well, that's not how it says it's supposed to happen in the Bible. <laughs> that's not really what's going to happen I'm using hyperbole you understand to make a point but when the Lord Jesus comes everybody will know exactly what happened but some people are just so critical of every single thing that's happening I don't have any idea what's happening in Asbury I'm not there I pray that revival has broken out that the Lord is moving in a mighty and a powerful way in the hearts of these young students up there but when you look at scripture when you look at scripture you really don't see a call for us to pursue revival in the way that we think about revival. You really don't see that, generally speaking, particularly in the epistles that instruct us how to do church. Again, God can do what he wants to do, and I pray that there's a powerful move in the hearts of people. And I pray that there's revival here in Clarksville, Tennessee. I pray that the Wade Church would be the center of revival, and, and, and we would bring the light of the gospel message to this darkened community. But we see sometimes that Scripture tells us that revival starts in a much different way, perhaps, than what we think it does. Uh, and, and, and we see we're given almost a recipe for what that would look like to revive the hearts of men as we talk about the fruit of discipline in 2 Peter chapter 1. I will start reading in verse 8. The word says this, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing... They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is no, so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. 
Jesus, I pray as we turn from singing your praises to worshiping you through the preaching of your word, God, that you would work in the hearts of your people this morning. Grant us repentance, call us to obedience, and Lord, that you would illuminate truth to us. And it's in your holy name that we do pray. Amen. I want to talk about the fruit of discipline. So in these verses, there's four verses here, uh, 8 through 11. And what we see in these verses are a series of conditional statements. Conditional statements where God says, if you will do this, then I will do this. If you will do this, then I will do something different. And the temptation for us is to misunderstand what God is saying here and, and misunderstand what is going on here. And it reminds me of Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says this, if you forgive others, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And that seems to, on the surface, if we only had that verse, that would seem to make our forgiveness from God dependent upon our forgiveness of others. But what happens in the Greek here is you have an assumed imperative. It's a conditional clause, but obedience is assumed. Jesus is assuming that believers will be forgiving because they have been forgiven much. And so really it is a descriptive phrase that describes how a believer is to conduct himself. And you see the exact same thing here in 2 Peter. Verse 8, he says, if these qualities are yours. Well, what qualities is he talking about? We have to rewind to last week. And you remember the qualities when we talked about the discipline of a Christian last week. We talked about the qualities of, of virtue and knowledge and self-control and steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and brotherly affection and love, and that we make every effort to supplement our faith, to build upon our faith, that our, our faith is a starting place that is given to us, it is bestowed upon us, the preciousness of our faith. And our discipline is that we make every effort, we spare no expense to build upon that foundation of faith in cultivating these qualities in our life. But again, it is an assumed imperative God is assuming that his people will do exactly that. Scripture knows nothing of a believer that does not cultivate love in his heart, that does not cultivate the knowledge of God in his heart, that does not cultivate self-control and steadfastness and godliness and affection for the body. That, 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 is, a, that is a contradictory statement, a, a Christian that would not pursue these things. And so we have a Warning and an exhortation here. And I pray that you all would leave here in two conditions today. I pray that you would leave here convicted and encouraged as we talk about the fruit of our discipline. Discipline is modified by time. Right up front, he says, if these qualities of, you know, that we just listed, if they are yours, if you have them, if you're cultivating them, and they are increasing. Listen, if it's increasing, that implies the condition of time. Nothing increases instantaneously. There's at least some time there. Time is revelatory. Time reveals things. I mean, you can fake anything for a period of time. Uh, consider Judas. Uh, you know, walked with the Lord for nearly three years uh, and was faking in his heart this whole time. But he says that, that if these qualities are yours and they're increasing over time, time is the first component. And what a hurry so many of us are in. I want it now. The idea of waiting for anything is anathema. I mean, our entire culture exists around the idea of, of instantaneous gratification. I want it. I want it not now, but I want it yesterday. We live in a, a fast food culture, a car loan culture. And again, the idea of saving and, and for anything. And, and, and that has applied to our spiritual lives as well. I mean, many people say, well, I went to church for a little bit and nothing happened. I read the Bible for a little while and nothing happened. I even prayed a little bit and nothing happened. I did some good works and nothing happened. I gave some money, but nothing has changed. And, and when we think about revival, listen, I pray that God is reviving these students up in Asbury, that God would revive us. But what we got to be careful of is this idea of revivalism. That we try to generate some sort of emotion. We try to fan the flames of the passion of the people with the experiential. We try to recreate the Mount of Transfiguration. That is not the call that we see in Scripture. We see the discipline of a Christian over time. That we would not be impatient in our walk. 
that we would make every effort over time. I think of the biblical view of patience. Consider Paul, when he was called, he went to Arabia for three years before he really started to minister. Three years. Would we be willing to wait three days, three weeks, three months? Consider Abraham. We studied until he, Abraham, 25 years from the making of a promise to the fulfillment of a promise. How many of us would be content to wait for 25 years when we think about this idea of time and being disciplined over time? So again, Peter gives us this statement, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, and then he begins to give us the fruit of discipline, what, what discipline generates. Uh, the first fruit I want to talk about is the idea of effectiveness, fruitfulness. This tells us that our default condition is ineffectiveness, unfruitfulness. That if we are content to just sit and do nothing in the practice of our faith, then nothing will occur. There will be no fruit. There will be no effectiveness. And we talk about effectiveness, and he uses a double negative here. He says it will keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful. But what he's saying is the converse is true, is that if you are practicing these qualities that are increasing over time, you will be effective. You will be effective. Well, effective in what? What does he possibly mean by that? Well, Colossians 1.13, I'd like to remind you, tells us that God says that he, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus, has transferred you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his son. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 tells us that he has prepared a work for you in eternity past. He loved you. He knew you. He called you. He redeemed you. And he has equipped you to do every good work that he has called you to do, that you would be effective for the advance of the kingdom of God and whatever he is calling you to do, that you would be active, that you would be obedient. So when you are disciplined over time, when these qualities are increasing in you over time, God accomplishes things through you to advance the kingdom of God as you labor. Listen, these qualities are all edifying to the kingdom of God. If you consider these qualities that, that Peter gives these discouraged Christians... Consider virtuous Christians. Virtuous Christians edify the kingdom of God. When we pursue godly things, when we are about the business of God, when we seek to do things God's way and, and to do them well, to do them with excellence, that adds to the witness of the body of Christ. Listen, knowledgeable Christians edify the body of Christ, build up the kingdom of God. We have some super knowledgeable people in this body, and I just love it. It was a couple years ago. We had a man in this church. He's PCS, but he would he would text me during the church service. Literally, I'd get done and I'd look at my phone after the church was all said and done, and I'd have a text that said, "Hey, pastor, about seven minutes into your sermon, you said this. Well, did you mean this, or what? You know, what about this?" I mean, he would he would ask me questions, and, and I loved that. That I had a brother that was so engaged that he would engage me on that level. And we've got some super knowledgeable people in our body that, that hold us accountable, that guard the body of Christ. Because remember, this is a truth war, and there are elements that would actively seek to inject untruth into the body. And yes, it's upon the elders to guard the body, but it's much easier to guard knowledgeable sheep than unknowledgeable sheep. So knowledgeable Christians build up the body of Christ. Self-controlled Christians protect the body of Christ. Remember, a self-controlled Christian is one that is not governed by his passions. And it is the passions of men sometimes that seek to tear apart the church. You have self-controlled Christians. They protect the body of Christ. You have steadfast Christians. They preserve the body of Christ. I'm talking Christians that are in it till the end. Christians that remain. Christians that abide. Christians that don't quit, don't walk away. Steadfast Christians preserve the body of Christ. Godly Christians refine the body of Christ and again protect the witness. What is the charge of the world against the church but hypocrisy? Well, listen, the world will always make the charge of hypocrisy against the church because the world hates the church. But when we are godly in our disciplines, what we do is we levy that charge useless. And that charge is only against Christ. And again, loving Christians, when we are loving, this strengthens the body of Christ, that our bonds of love bind us together and preserve the body of Christ. All of these disciplines that we practice edify the church. 
rendering you effective for the kingdom of God. So make every effort, make every effort to increase these qualities over time, that you would be fruitful. If they're yours over time, uh, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful so that you would be fruitful. Well, what does it mean to be fruitful? Well, if you think about a tree bearing fruit in a, in a fruit tree, what is the fruit? That, I mean, if the, you have a fruit tree that bears no fruit, then it's a useless tree. <laughs> and, and so when you, you have the actual fruit from the tree, that is something that is useful for us. And I think of the words of Jesus again, back to the Sermon on the Mount. Every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by your fruits. Listen, I used to think about this idea when we would go to the apartment buildings uh, down the road and door to door before we started going to Fort Campbell and we would witness to these folks in these apartment buildings and, and everybody, it was a waste of time because everybody in the apartment was already a Christian. And, and I really did have a man tell me I was saved in 1973 and I haven't had anything to do with the church since then. Well, listen, when you become redeemed, there's some things that happen. There's some fruit that happens in your life. Number one, an increasing love for God and the, the things of God. An increasing hatred of sin. And even more than that, an increasing hatred of your own sin. The further you walk, the harder it gets to look at somebody else's sin without looking at your own sin. I think of the words of Paul. Paul describes himself as the least of all the apostles. A couple years later, he describes himself as the least of all the brothers. A couple years later, he describes himself as the chief of all sinners. The more that Paul walked in the faith, the more he became aware of his own sin. As we follow God, we have an increasing desire to do godly things, to make disciples, to evangelize. We have an increasing love for the people of God. And so I looked at this man and I thought in my heart, you're lying to yourself, sir. There's absolutely no fruit in your life. Effectiveness and fruitfulness are the fruits of discipline. Now, Peter gives us the fruit of indiscipline here also at the same time in verses 8 and verses 9. This tells us that it is possible to not practice these qualities for a season. Everybody goes through spiritual mountains, spiritual valleys, highs and lows, ups and downs, uh, the ebbs and flows of our lives. Everybody goes through those. And, and I don't know where you're at today. I don't know where the Lord has brought you from today, but you're here, here in the Word of God, singing His praises. So something good is happening. But again, I, I, everybody goes through ups and downs. But the general trajectory of every Christian is toward Christ. But Peter tells us if you are not practicing these qualities, you are ineffective or unfruitful. And the idea here is idleness. That you are idle. You're on the team. You're on the team, but you, you never get into the game. You like to wear the jersey to school. You like to get in the team photos. You like to tell the girls that you're on the team so you can get a date, maybe. You don't even go to practice that much. But you're on the team, hey. Another illustration I thought of was uh, the highway department. And, and again, I, I don't know if this holds true, and if you work for the highway department, please forgive me, don't take offense. But there used to be this uh, kind of caricature of the highway department that you know there'd be a pothole and there'd be one guy you know, digging and then there would be, you know, 10 dudes standing around leaning on their shovels watching the one guy work. And unfortunately, that is a caricature of the church. 90% of the work done by 10% of the people. And conversely, I wasn't going to say this, but 10% or 90% of the problems caused by 10% of the people. 90% of the work done by 10% of the people. And part of the issue with this is we have attributed ourselves, or we have contributed to this issue, and, and, and the way we've done that is with the professionalization of the pastorate. Consider the professionalization of the, the pastorate, how that breeds the indiscipline in the body of Christ. Listen, I don't really need you to do anything. You just give me money. You pay me money, pay my staff money, and we'll do all the work for you. I may ask you to do a couple things. I don't want to ask you to do too much, because if I ask you to do too much, you may actually leave and go somewhere else where they will ask 
less of you. And God forbid I actually ask you to sacrifice anything, to, to give of yourself, to give sacrificially. And so we see this professionalization of the pastor that contributes to the indiscipline and the idleness of the Christian in contradiction to the priesthood of every believer. Responsibility of the church is to provide you opportunities to be effective and fruitful, to exercise these disciplines. Listen, you want to be effective and fruitful here at the way. I want you to hear me now. And if you hear nothing else I say, hear this. Walk in discipleship. Walk in discipleship. If you are not in discipleship with a brother or sister in Christ, you are missing the major component of the Christian faith. And we can do some things to help you. Say, Brad, say, Eric, I'm not in discipleship. Can you help lash me up with a brother or sister? We'd love to do that. Our goal here is that every single person is in discipleship. Or if you're not, it's because you said no. I mean, it's America. You can still do what you want, right? And then be in discipleship and then give discipleship. The Great Commission is for everyone. It does not say make disciples when you're ready. Make disciples if you have time. Make disciples if you get around to it. This is not what the Great Commission says. Listen, I understand busyness. I understand busyness just as much as you do. And we all have a million different things to do. But what matters most to you? You want an opportunity to be effective and fruitful. You walk in discipleship here at the way. You raise your hand and say, put me in coach and say, I want to serve. You can serve in the children's ministry. Get with Derek. What a, what a great call to minister to the children of this church. And how can I be of assistance to that? Get involved in our outreach. <clears throat> we go to Fort Campbell and share the gospel with these soldiers. Go to Trace Diaz coming up in a couple of months. An entire weekend ministry designed to take believers, fire them up in the Lord, and send them back to their church to serve. We do it every six months. Go to Trace this. Get involved in the Clarksville Covenant House. We need another slide, guys. There's infinite opportunities for you to raise your hand and say, put me in, coach. Tons of opportunities to be effective and fruitful right here at the way. The choice is yours. And Paul says, or I'm sorry, Peter says this. If you're not practice these, practicing these qualities in verse 9, <clears throat> you're so nearsighted that he is blind. Some of your versions say short-sighted. You're blind. What does that mean? Well, he just tells us what that means. Having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. God, forgive us for forgetting that we were cleansed from our sins. Is there a more important thing that we ought to remember than that we were cleansed from our former sins, that we were redeemed? And so this is Peter's exhortation, that you would remember that you were cleansed from your former sins and be disciplined in the practice of these qualities. That's not really what I want to talk about, though, all those things. Those are all important things, but there's some other business I really want to talk about when we talk about the fruit of discipline. It goes on, verse 10, to say this, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. The fruit of discipline I'd like to talk about here is the fruit of assurance. The fruit of assurance. Is there a more valuable fruit than the fruit of assurance? And the way I know that that is valuable is I know people who walk lacking assurance. I'm here today to assure you that if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus, your salvation is surely secure. Bought and paid for, secured, from eternity past to eternity future. Listen to the words of Timothy when he says this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. I had one Timothy mark. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, he says this. But God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows who are his. The Lord knows who are his. There's not a doubt in his mind. There's no question in the mind of the Lord who are his sheep, who will be his sheep. No doubt whatsoever. Listen, we see in verse 3 of 2 Peter chapter 1, he says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness 
Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. And so we see a combination of knowledge and calling that is secure. Listen, we heard that the gospel message is foolishness to those who are perishing. Before you are redeemed, the gospel message makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And I remember hearing the gospel message as an unredeemed adult and thinking it was absolute foolishness. But here we have this combination between knowledge and calling. And this is the effectual call whereby God goes to the hearts of his people and he literally reaches into your chest and removes your heart of stone and replaces it with a heart of flesh that you may believe. So we've got to confirm our calling. We've got to confirm our election that we were a chosen in eternity past, according to the purposes of his good pleasure. I love the words of Romans chapter 8, the golden chain of salvation. Some of the sweetest words in all of scripture that assure us that those he foreknew, he predestined, and those he predestined, he called, and those he called, he justified, and those he justified, he glorified. He will not lose one of his sheep. Not one single one of his sheep will he lose. That's such good news. But we've got to confirm that in our own hearts, in our own minds. It's not an external confirmation. It's true. Truth does not need to be confirmed to establish truth as being true. This is the truth of your salvation. But paid for. But confirmation is so important. It matters here that Peter would tell these discouraged Christians. Why do you think Christians get so discouraged? Because they got no assurance. So many wrestle with assurance. And today there are even lots of denominations and different churches that teach against assurance. I tell you that you can lose, that you can give away that which was bestowed upon you. Is there a more effective tactic of the enemy? Listen, can you consider an actual physical army, a physical army marching into battle? And can you imagine if the soldiers in that army were not even really convinced if they were actually soldiers in the army? We see the exact same thing happening today. We see the devil whispering into the ears of believers and we've populated the ranks with half-hearted soldiers for Christ, not fully convinced of their own standing before God. This is not God's will for your life. Book of 1 John tells us, John wrote the book of 1 John that you may know that you have eternal life. Listen, I, I stole this from Scott Dollar and I say this unashamedly. If you are doubting your salvation, you get out the book of 1 John and you start reading and you read until one of two things happen, until the Holy Spirit of God testifies with your spirit that you are a child of God, or the Holy Spirit of God says you are not a child of God and you need to be redeemed. This is the full reason we wrote the book, Am I Saved? Right back there on the shelf to wrestle or help people understand their assurance. And so here Peter tells us, practice these qualities. Be disciplined them over time as confirmation to your soul. When we are disciplined to practice these qualities over time, it is confirmation to our souls. And so as we are more loving, as we are more godly, more steadfast, more self-controlled, more knowledgeable, more virtuous today than we were yesterday. That's confirmation to our souls. And in verse 10, he goes on to say this. If you practice these qualities, you will never fall. What does, Paul, what does Peter mean by that? You will never fall. Maybe he's talking about falling to sin. That if you practice these qualities, you will fall into sin. Well, we know that elsewhere, the scripture says that if you uh, say you have no sin, you lie and don't practice the truth. And so there's an aspect is as we practice these qualities, they, they enable and empower us to, to resist sin, to, to walk away from sin, to, uh, to deny the sin nature that we all wrestle with. There's truth there in that. And we got to practice it. He says, if you practice these qualities, again, over time, we don't practice one time and get good at anything. But what I really want to talk about today is not everything we've talked about now, but the ultimate fruit of our discipline, and that is the fruit of victory. You see, when he says you will never fall, there's an aspect of now, but really he's talking in eternity. 
I mean, we've got to be really careful about how we talk about these disciplines today. I could tell you this. You say, look, I just I wasn't really loving last week. I, I wasn't self-controlled. I lost some self-control. I wasn't steadfast. I wasn't godly last week. I, I fell into sin. And I could stand up here and I could tell you, look, go, go home and try harder. You're just not trying hard enough. Just go and, and be better. I could place this great burden upon you. And unfortunately, I believe that this is a great burden that the modern church places upon the believer. This great burden of obedience. Just do better. Just try harder. Just give it the college try. You're not, you're not knuckling down hard enough. You're not exercising enough willpower. Because listen, these qualities are not meritorious in and of themselves. They are the fruit of something greater, something deeper. And I like the words of Paul. I'm resting in these words. And I pray that you'll rest in these words with me today. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, when he says this, he says, We all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. If you want to be conformed into the image of God, you want to practice these qualities. You want to grow and increase in these qualities. The ultimate exhortation I can give you today is to behold Christ. Gaze upon Jesus. The problem is if I, leave, I tell you to leave here today and to go be more loving, to go be more knowledgeable, to go be more of all these qualities, you will fail. You will fail and then you will be dejected and discouraged and you wonder why Christians are so discouraged. But my exhortation to you today is to behold Christ. There is no one who is more loving. There is no one who is more knowledgeable. No one more self-controlled. There is no one more godly than Christ. And so my job as a pastor is to hold up Jesus to you. Would you look to Jesus today? And as you behold Jesus you become what you behold. You become what you behold. And as we hold up Jesus, as we consider Jesus, as we look to Jesus, as we meditate upon Jesus, as we contemplate about Jesus, as we consider Jesus, we become like Jesus. And then we will be more loving, more knowledgeable, more self-controlled. Listen to Romans chapter 5, verse 17. He has given us the free gift of righteousness. You are not righteous in and of yourself. And what does righteous mean? But you are obedient to the law. You can never be righteous in and of yourself. But the righteousness of Christ has been given to you. And even more than that, you have been declared righteous. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of Christ. And so listen, the greatest promise, the precious and very great promise of all of this text is that your righteousness tomorrow, your righteousness in eternity is secure in the unshakable, matchless, irresistible, immovable and perfect righteousness of Christ. And there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What are you so discouraged about? What are you walking around with your head down between your hands about? At the righteousness of Christ. You are the righteousness of Christ. If you are in Christ. So the ultimate fruit of our discipline is victory. Victory today, victory tomorrow, victory forever. Listen, the Christian walk is not some kind of funeral march. It is a victory procession. Unto eternity. We're lying in the streets as the procession is gone. We're casting gifts at the Lord as he casts gifts back to us. On his way to the coronation of a king. He's already on the throne. But one day there's going to be a consummation of the kingdom. Inevitably as he returns. As we are disciplined to look to Christ. Look to Christ. I am not here today to exhort you to holiness and discipline directly. I'm here today to hold up Christ to you. That you would look to Christ today. And all these other things will naturally be added to you. What a precious and very great promise this is. Is there a better promise? That's some good news right there. That's some good news right there. 
Maybe the reason you struggle with being loving, knowledgeable, self-controlled, and all these things is maybe you don't know Christ. You can't look to Christ if you don't know Christ. And I'm talking about the Jesus of the Bible. Boy, I'd love to introduce you to the Jesus of the Bible today. You got to grab somebody here in the church and say, can, can you tell me about the Jesus of the Bible? I'm going to pray. We're going to sing a song. And whatever business the Lord has laid upon your heart, you know, Scripture demands a response. And that response could be repentance. It could be obedience. Saying no to God is also a response. And then we are going to partake in the ordinance of the Lord's Supper right after that. And I pray that if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus, you would partake in the Lord's Supper with us. Let us pray. Jesus, we love you and we praise you, God. You're a good and a gracious king. And God, I'm thankful for this precious truth this morning. I'm thankful for your righteousness. I don't have to struggle. I don't have to toil. I don't have obligation. I have opportunity. It's not about duty. It's about devotion. And so, God, we bring our discipline to you as tribute to a king, not as tax to a tyrant. In our gratitude for your grace, Lord, I pray that you would flush out these qualities in each and every single one of us, these disciplines. Lord, forgive us for when we've been unloving. I've been unloving. Everybody here has been unloving. God, maybe we need to seek somebody out here on our knees and say, forgive me, brother, for not loving you the way I should have. Forgive you, my wife, for not loving you the way I should have. Forgive you, my husband, for not loving you the way I should. So forgive us, Jesus, for our lack of godliness, for allowing sin to, uh, for even just a little bit of leaven, to leaven the whole lump. Forgive us. But God, most of all, I pray that you would forgive us for our legalistic hearts. Forgive us for ever thinking that we could have earned our salvation. Forgive us for thinking that we need to do stuff to maintain our salvation. Forgive us for applying merit to all these things when the only true merit is found in you. God, I thank you for giving us this Sabbath rest. And I'm not talking about the day of the week, God. I'm talking about the Sabbath, the rest that we have in you, Jesus when you freed us from the obligation to carry around a burden that no man could ever carry. Grant us rest, eternal rest, starting right now. Jesus, thank you for that. Thank you, Jesus, for relieving us of the crushing burden of sin, the crushing burden of self-righteousness. And so we look to you, Jesus. And I pray for each and every single believer here that we would look to you, that we would behold you, that we might become like you, Christ-like, this entire body. Lord, purify us this morning. And lastly, Lord, be a single person here that's not redeemed, that's never re believed upon the Lord Jesus, repented of sins and been saved, that this would be the day of salvation. And so God bless us and keep us. And it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Will you stand with us as we sing?